Historically, we've always been known for getting it right when it comes to color. Fluorescents were a challenge when it came to uh, spectrum. And so at the very early history of our company, I reached out to Kodak and one of their color scientists helped us establish what it was that should be a decent spectrum for, uh, you know, maybe I'll wait a little bit till a few more people come in. Not at all, not at all. <clears throat> so anyway, as KinoFlow and Kodak got together, we figured out what kind of a spectrum we needed for film, because Kodak actually had the spectral response curves of film, and uh, we worked together with some phosphor engineers and actually developed a spectrum that was now you know, appropriate for uh, motion picture film. Uh, Fujifilm also came on board. They were very cooperative and would share the data that they had on their response curves. They would give me X, Y coordinates and a whole lots of information. And that really enabled us to uh, perform and, and create a product that was really uh, conducive to good imaging. So uh, <clears throat> jump into the present. Uh, silver halides are out. Zeros and ones are in. And now it's gotten much more complex than what we had before. And when you think of it, Back in the film days, Kodak took all that color science and embedded it in the emulsion. Straightforward. Camera was mechanical. All you have to do is expose it correctly, hope the soup is correct as it goes through, you've got a great image. Still had to do some color correction, because one of the things we also knew is that film didn't quite see all the colors, but pff, that's another story. So what we have now, though, is a really unique situation uh, we have the perfect recipe for chaos. And what we have is a, a lighting system that's its own color science. You have a camera that's its own color science. But it's not just one camera. It's a multitude of cameras, still cameras, motion picture cameras, uh, industrial cameras. So now you've really laid out a lot of variables. And let me just focus on the cinematography side. As a cinematographer, in the past, we've always had the ability to run camera tests. Even when you, you had film stock and you sort of knew how it would behave, you still wanted to do those tests. So what I'm going to talk about at this presentation, then, <clears throat> is some of the challenges that are now, that you know you're obviously facing, but you not, may not be able to understand why are these things happening? What am I seeing here? How can I explain this? Especially explaining it to someone f further up the, food change, uh, up the food chain who aren't giving you the time to do testing and whatnot. So in this presentation, I'm going to talk about the principles of white light. We always talk about, we refer to it as white light. What in fact is it? A lot of people have different impressions of what that is. We'll talk about how do you measure that white light? What are these indexes? What are the tools available for us to do that? We'll talk about differences in white light spectrum. All white light is not created the same. We need to understand what is a gamut. What is it on a device? What is it on a light? What is it on a camera? And then, of course, the challenges of trying to color match between manufacturers of lighting, not just that, but also camera. So it gets to be uh, quite a complex uh, undertaking when you really consider all those variables. So just to visualize what is white light, I mean, he, this chart on the left is the CIE color space chart. Many of you may already be quite familiar with this. Some of you might not. But this is, go, dates back to 1931. This was a way of visualizing what the human eye can perceive. And so you see the outside border is all your saturated colors. Um, and then as they recede, as the saturation level goes down into the white light. Our human eye perceives from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers. So. To the left of 400, we're talking about ultraviolet. Eyes can't see that. Some cameras can. 700 nanometers on to the right, IR, infrared. Eyes can't see it. Some of the electronic cameras used to see it. Created some real challenges. There's an interesting thing called the Planckian locus. Now, the Planckian locus is that curve that you see running through there. And if you can imagine a piece of metal, such as that filament, heating up, starts off orange, and as it heats up, it goes into white, then blue. That's a very sort of simple 
illustration of what the Planckian locus is. It's also known as the black body curve. Now, each one of those intersecting lines, you see 4,000, 3,000, 2,000, a, a um, color meter will give you that value. What it won't necessarily tell you, if you're looking at the CIE color chart, is where along, well, actually, a CIE color chart will tell you where it is along that line relative to the Planckian locus. The Planckian locus, or the black body curve, is an important thing to remember because that is where the theoretical white point is. Now, you'd hope that camera manufacturers, for the most part, would track the Planckian. They do when it comes to continuous light sources like, like tungsten. When it comes to an LED source, which in and of itself is discontinuous, this is where the challenges come into play. And so the, the net result is that it may not, that the white point may not necessarily fall on that Planckian curve. So this is where I'll explain with, with meters how that might create even more confusion. So any color point that's going to fall below that vertical line, if it falls below the, the Planckian, it'll be magenta, and above, it'll appear somewhat green. And so this is what we see on cameras when you're looking at a skin tone, and you go, well, it looked great on this camera, but on this camera, I'm seeing a little bit of magenta, or I'm seeing a little bit of green. Again, it's the camera's response to that, quote unquote, white source that's putting it either above or, or below the line. So one of the ways of uh, achieving white light is what we started off at KinoFlow is we've, al we've always had a 3200 and a 6500 Kelvin. And so the logic would have it that if you've got a full spectrum white, two good high quality whites, or a bicolor, and you just blend them, you're going to be fine through the entire track. Not a problem. But what you find out is that it's a direct linear relationship. It's not a curve as they blend. So the minute you start blending a bicolor, it falls off the Planckian. It falls off the black body. It tends to go magenta. Now, some cameras see this more pronounced than others, but this is an inherent issue with bicolor. So what do you do? Well, by introducing RGB, red, green, blue, you can actually lift those color points and raise them up and actually follow uh, the, the Planckian curve. Now, some cameras are going to track slightly above, some below. Some, th some of them start above, and some of them end up below. So it's, it's really depending on the camera. And so we wouldn't have known any of this unless we profiled a lot of cameras and did all this research. And it was fascinating, to say the least. So it comes down to you've got to think about every cinema camera as a film stock. The same way we thought about film stock in the past is that film stock had their own subtle nuances. You chose a film stock for a particular look that you're going for. Fuji tended to be uh, rich in greens. So if you're doing a lot of big exteriors, big majestic uh, you know, exterior movies, that may be a choice for you. Um, and again, every film stock, there was a reason for a cinematographer to go with one or the other. Producers never, ever decided what film stock to shoot. Yet every producer now seems to have the, have the authority and the ability to understand what's the best camera for you to work with. It's madness, complete madness, because you're taking the control, that creative control, away from the cinematographer. So if there are any producers in the, in the audience, please give your cinematographer the courtesy of letting them choose the camera that they want to work with. Lights. If you go back historically through uh, motion picture history, we were, we're fortunate enough to work with full spectrum light for the most part of it. Um, the only time that we weren't working with a full spectrum light was in the very early days when we had orthochromatic film. Orthochromatic film was sensitive to only uh, blue and green light. And there they used what they called Cooper Hewitt lamps. These were mercury vapor lamps. Very high in ultraviolet. They did real good eye, da eye damage. And fortunately, that was surpassed rather quickly. So from there, we had tungsten, quartz, xenon arc, HMI, even the fluorescent lamp, where we say, ooh, the fluorescent lamp had a spike on it. Yes, it did, but it had more continuous spectrum than today's LED. Unusual. Somebody might dispute that, but if you're working with our uh, T12, uh, KF55s, and, and 32s, very broad spectrum. It had a mercury spike, which was green, and we adjusted that. When we refer to that Planckian, we brought the actual color point on the Planckian, so it was neutral. So that's how we got around that while still displaying a, uh, a, a spike lamp. 
So now, LEDs do present a particular challenge because they are discontinuous lights, uh, discontinuous spectrum. And since these cameras all have unique spectral response curves, they're not going to necessarily see the same light source the same way.